type of, of transport solution, uh, which we're really hoping will, will be replicated locally. We're also really interested to see how that combines or competes or complements, hopefully, uh, the existing uh, public transport network as well. So I think we're going to get some really good learnings locally, but in the meantime, I think people uh, in the area of operation uh, initially are going to get a new type of public transport offering, um, which, which hopefully will be good for them. And then finally, just switching back for a second, if I can, to the transport survey, uh, transport focus survey results. One of the areas that we've identified where we don't see some clearly water between ourselves and other urban areas, and where our, um, our satisfaction scores have either stagnated or in some cases gone backwards a little bit, is in terms of satisfaction with the waiting environment, which is something that really is largely within the control of, uh, of Mersey Travel. So with that in mind, we're developing a program of uh, a new program of surveys for our stops and shelters so that we can start to build up again a picture of actually what's out there, focusing on things like cleanliness and maintenance and information. At the moment, all, all we can rely on is customer reports where things might be wrong, but we're not really doing anything proactive in, in that space. So, uh, so we're going to be starting up in, in the autumn a program which really starts to build up uh, that picture gives us some value, hopefully some valuable information that will inform the action that we need to take to start to improve uh, those scores. And I'll be happy to come back at a future meeting and feedback on, on progress on that. So I think that summarises for me the key <coughs> points in the report, which I'd be really happy to take any questions. Thanks. Uh, so that's about Ron first, and then I'll have uh, Jeff, Francis, uh, Gordon, and Thanks, Chair. Uh, can I just first of all
three miles one way from Eccleston into St Helens and then coming all the way back to, to a couple of buses to Whiston. We've also got school children who go to school in Prescott, which if they were to, there's no bus service, so they'd have to, there's from probably where they, 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 the children come from, it's about a two mile walk to the just down to uh, St Helens Road itself. And then they've got to cross over the road to get to the school in Prescott. We've also got a, cr a cricket club there <coughs> which people use. We've got a horse riding stable. We've got other people who like to go to Prescott the shop. Uh, instead of getting the bus, lots of people have to spend extra money to go on, on taxis. And what you said before, uh, and it's, it's down here, it's about money, not people. It's about money nowadays. And I think, uh, Ron, uh, touched on it before and sometimes I think bus uh, companies put their hands in the pockets and helped out uh, it would be far better uh, and that's all I have to say and well there's, there's also Rain Hill, lots of link from Rain Hill um, to, down the link road to St Helens I mean Eccleston uh, and Rain Hill are uh, border areas of St Helens and I think that they do seem, seem to suffer uh, from lack of bus service. Thank you. Yeah. Matt, do you want to come back on to the route specifics? Yeah, sure. So uh, I take all, all the points you, you made there. Um, uh, what I'd encourage you to do <coughs> is we've, we've, we've just started the, if you like, the next round of, of network reviews with St. Helens. So I'd really encourage you. Um, directly and, and others as well to feed into that process because that's much more about making sure that the right links are in place for people and that the bus network is doing what it needs to do uh, as, as much as it is about looking at the resource levels that, that we have which was uh, certainly one of the focuses of the, the previous uh, the previous round so in terms of the points you make I'll make sure I feed those back to the team uh, after this uh, after this session, but uh, the, the bigger point I would really encourage is as we want as much feedback as possible from people about how they use the network, what links they want to see, uh, and we really want to make sure that we're building in people's views into that network review process. Yeah, just echo uh, Matt's points there, Jeff, in the sense that um, if we can encourage as many residents as possible to sort of highlight some of these issues, we can look at what's in the sort of art of the possible about how links can be put together. Well, I'd also strongly support the comment that you made about kind of how um, really bus operators need to think about the contribution that they make. And I do think kind of in all the kind of work that we're doing on how we could use devolved powers, that issue of how kind of money from profitable routes can be used to support socially necessary routes is going to be a very, very important question. You know, like that. So I think we fully kind of enjoy that comment that you made accordingly. Francis. Matt, can I ask you, do you class your passengers as disabled passengers as second-rate citizens? When my husband left this meeting uh, on time in a wheelchair and got refused by a 10A driver that he couldn't get on the bus. I can't speak on behalf of bus operators that obviously you're, you're referring to. Uh, I'm sure that if you were, if you were to give us the details of exactly what and what and when what happened and when that happened, we'd be happy to feed that back to whichever operator it was and get an answer for you. But but very clearly, the, the bus network is designed now to be 100% uh, accessible. There is one wheelchair space on board uh, every vehicle, and um, and operators have their own policies in place around uh, around ensuring people have, uh, have access to the network. So in terms of the specifics, I, I'd appreciate kind of more details so we can follow that specific one. Well, what happened was uh, there was a stagecoach laid off and the 10A, the Reva came up and he seen us and went and ran on the bus station again. And as soon as we went to get on, he said, you can't get on this bus. He said, it's only for electric wheelchairs. And my husband felt as if he was a second class citizen. He really, really, really was upset. 
Can, can I just say, say in this man, that's, that's completely not acceptable. And yeah, you shouldn't be being treated in that manner. Um, what I would sort of strongly, strongly encourage if anything like that ever happens, make sure it's reported straight away. I did, um, I did report it to, is it Jeannie or Jenny in St. Helens? That had a, a, a river in St. Helens and, and nobody came that. back. Well, that's completely not acceptable because if that was after the last meeting, um, that would have been a month ago. Uh, and so I think that's kind of a bomb. Um, so we will happily kind of chase some of those points up for you. And if it ever happens again, as soon as that happens, that needs to be reported because that's completely unacceptable. Well, there was another lady today. Um, she said her daughter was autistic. And she said to the driver, Can I just put my daughter to sit down on the seat? And then I'll come back and pay the fare. He said, No, you'll have to get off the bus. Well, any kind of operational issues like that, please report to us straight away. Yeah, no one's reported. We will no obviously chase over the relevant operations. Yeah. Uh, can I also ask, um, you know, now we're getting the new Shakespeare North in Prescott. Are you putting any more transport on for it? That's certainly something that we would be looking at as a day to day kind of activity for us. If there's new developments, whether that be housing developments or employment sites or leisure sites <laughs> and such as that, then clearly as, as part of the development, we look at making sure that that site is accessible to buses first off, first off and also we look at the network provision around that as well. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. And combined authority has allocated money to make the railway station accessible and upgrading yeah, so that will be happening. Cool. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, firstly, uh, the, just three little points really. Just want to say uh, well done to everyone for the, uh, for the work at the bus station at Google Strand. Really good to see. Um, I've made a few visits and uh, I've got to say you don't always uh, uh, realise that when you look around at something you see in the daytime and don't see it from Perspective, but the number of comments that I got that were complimentary about the nighttime appearance and the lighting was extremely good. It was very, very good. Well, thanks for all that, people. Thank you, Gary. Uh, the Arriva, the Arriva clip one, I'm, I'm just, I've, I've had some explanation of what's being carried out, and I believe the fare is one pound a mile. I've been told that on reliable evidence. So, if I get on an Ariba clip bus and I'm paying, how do I know they're going to charge me two miles when I think I've only done one? Who's going to be the arbitrator? I think there's a great, I think you're going to arbitrate, let's take them. <coughs> Come on my side. But I think, I think to be fair, it's something, you've got to experiment with something new and see where it goes. And maybe at a future meeting of this committee we could get more information from them on it. But that's all. The other one is the equality and diversity implications, number six, page 29. Not a lot of the detail in that one, I think, because I know in a previous meeting, um, you gave a great, you gave a really great section on that. And I just think maybe if that had been referenced, that you'd done that previously, what the meeting date was. I have to say, um, in a future, as a general comment, can I say, that there has been a very, very noticeable improvement in how we report equality and diversity issues. I think it, be, it shows that we're officers unusually have listened to us and acted on it, and it is really good. So I have to say, you've done a, you've done a good job overall, but if, if that could be referenced, because I don't know the date of the meeting, Matt, that's all, but well done. I've just had the, the, the lady who's had a large uh, part in making sure that that's been sort of rectified sat next to the meeting tonight. I don't think there's any of those points you want to come back. I shall polish my head over. I don't think there's any of those points you want to come back on. Anthony, do you want to? Thank you, Chair. Just two points on the passenger survey, Matt. Um, back onto the bus stop, the collective stop which is 80% largely lower than those figures. I think in large the figures are quite well, they are critical the of the which is just which is but in terms of you know the, the report back of the conditions of the bus stops is there any way that we can look at some of the best practice examples of other cities and how we go forward and that 
but also on the um, reduction in the value of the money. And I don't think it's just about cost, it's also about the convenience of travel. And we looked at examples that sort of put the London there, it's just around the, the hop of the you do a journey within an hour that you get two tickets for the price of one, but also the, the new arena tickets get away from us modeling that into, into the into the bus network if you're going to go a mile up the road. Okay, I'm glad you made the point about the, the stops um, and the, uh, the kind of lower scores that we've experienced on that, and that's exactly why we're, um, we're, we're starting the process of, of conducting a number of surveys around that, because I think for us, we don't quite have the right level of information to be able to kind of judge what the issues are out, out there, and if there are kind of, if there are kind of systemic things that we need to fix, we just don't have the right level of information at the moment. So I think for us that's very much the starting point in building up a picture of, uh, of, kind of what's out there, what's the quality, what's the customer perceptions, what, what broke needs fixing, for want of a better phrase. Um, and then I think once we've got that, we can start to look at what's the best way of, uh, of, of addressing that. Is there good practice elsewhere? Is there something around the designs of the stops that we've got at the moment, which means that it's very hard to clean or harder to maintain, and I think that will that will come in the, in the course of time. A lot of the kind of maintenance of bus stops and the cleaning of bus stops is done by a third party, and I think that's a really important point as well. As we need to understand, are they performing in line with what our, what contractual uh, obligations are? So there's a few things there that I think we just need to get under the skin of first. But I think certain best practices uh, it is one of those things, and then. Just in terms of value for money, I think again you're right. It's value for money is partly cost, but partly what you're getting for the money that you that you're paying. So uh, if you're if you've got a really good, a really low bus fare, but you've got a really unreliable poor service that takes forever, then even though it's a low fare, you're going to think that's not great value for money. Likewise, if you pay maybe a slightly higher fare for some people, they may perceive that as value for money if they get a, a great service. And I think. Maybe over the last year that mix hasn't hasn't quite been right. Now, I know there's been some action taken, certainly by Reaver over recent months to reduce the price of their weekly tickets, and I think that's been, the evidence or the anecdotal that we've, we've had has been that's been a, a positive move. But I think there's this hasn't been the inroads, if I'm honest, on improving people's journeys and making them more punctual and more reliable. And that really has to be something that. Uh, that we work together with partners across the, the region on because that's a mix of ourselves and bus operators being there, part to make sure operationally they're efficient, but also district councils as well to make sure that bus uh, buses are flowing freely through junctions and along key arterial routes as well. John? Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, Matt Samson, I congratulate you for the report. Very detailed, very thorough. I the key performance indicators in general are, are outstanding, so congratulations to everybody concerned, really. My question relates to page 25, 3.3.3, section B, which is a bit complicated because I've got to look out there. Um, the award winning joint driver customer service training program was now concluded. Well, that's interesting because 85% of uh, Stagecoach drivers have actually accessed it, and only 52% of the reapers. So I'm just wondering what the, what the underlying reason is for that, basically. So, well, that's actually going to be improved. Thank you. It's a matter of numbers and volume, to, to be quite honest. And there's a little bit of when we first started this, and we were undertaking quite a bit of rail replacement activity as well, which kind of tightened up the availability of. Uh, of drivers. So in terms of availability, we've been able to kind of get a higher proportion of stagecoach drivers through, although the reader clearly have a lot more volume of, uh, of drivers. We're actually looking to, although we, we formally concluded that, we're looking at how we can get the remainder of drivers through that course. And it may, we can't do it in exactly the same way because the funding's kind of stopped to be able to do that externally, which I think is a really good way of being able to deliver it. But, we're, we're keen to kind of try and get drive, as many drivers through that course because we've seen the positive uh, results. We're also kind of looking at is there a possibility of developing a second module as well because I think everyone quite likes.
takes the way of, we've kind of pulled together on this and it's worked quite well and driver satisfaction with the course has been really high as well which is kind of quite unusual so it's certainly very much on our agenda we're looking at how we can maybe kind of access some funding to, to support the development and support the delivery of, uh, of this but I just wanted to kind of obviously close off that, that milestone. No further questions or comments, I was just going to sort of um, have a little bit. First and foremost, just to sort of say that um, from the passenger survey route results, it's no surprise to me using buses most days that we've got some of the friendliest bus drivers anywhere in the country. I think that's something um, you know, we need to sort of celebrate and acknowledge uh, as much as possible, particularly because I'm looking at two uh, people that have come through the industry driving buses. But, but seriously, uh, those people are the heroes of the industry. You know, they're the ones who provide the kind of customer facing uh, involvement day in, day out, and we couldn't sort of uh, see the, the transport network that we've got without the kind of great sort of efforts that they've put in. So it's, I think we should never miss the opportunity to sort of celebrate how good our bus drivers are. But obviously, just like kind of uh, John just highlighted, we want to make sure that we're continually kind of equipping them with all the skills uh, and giving them the kind of not just the training. Uh, but the kind of rewards that should go with uh, a very sort of fulfilling and successful career. I also think as well, at every opportunity, we need to kind of keep waving the banner about what a transformational uh, effect, and I don't use that word lightly, we've had with young persons travel. When you look at the fact that when we go back to the start of the journey uh, on this in 2013, the fact that uh, the number of young people um, making journeys on buses has gone up by 168%. Let's just say that again, 168%. We've more than doubled the number of kids on buses. Um, I would like to think that within the next year we could treble it because it's really has yeah. sort of shown how in practical terms we can do something which puts bums on seats, but most importantly, get young people out of the background our region to live their lives in the ways that they want to and really kind of raising their horizons to do whatever they want to. We should be really, really proud of that and I hope kind of all the team that have made that happen are as proud as we are as politicians about that practical result. But of course we're proud but never satisfied. So just like Ron says, we want to keep on focusing how we keep on lifting that bar. The one question that I've got, uh, and I think it's, it's great, in the appendices we sort of highlight the Yes to Bus campaign um, that's going to be done. And I think that's really good about something that's quite a blunt message actually, uh, yeah, and the way that it's going to be marketed to sort of turn people's heads to give the bus the go. Uh, the one bit that I, I have to say I was pretty disappointed about is the first vehicle I saw branding was an 06 plate. So whilst Ron's right, we have got uh, a lot of old vehicles that need to be moved on, but actually there are some great brand new vehicles out there that we should be sort of branding up as head turning. So it's a brand the sort of dog of the fleet, if you like, in kind of the new marketing livery, um, I think was a bit of an own goal. Can we go back to Ariba and say, I know they were planning on doing four vehicles, that they treat that 06 one as a fifth one and make sure that the ones they brand are some of the best quality vehicles. Because if we want to get people to take a second look, make sure we kind of put the family silver out there, not the kind of the chipped mugs from the back of the cupboard. So can we can we do that? Um, so there's, if there's no further questions or comments, uh, can I move the recommendation in paragraph two of the report? Okay, uh, it all comes down to money, uh, as I've highlighted uh, earlier in the conversation. So it's appropriate now that we move on to item 8, which is Mr. Charles' final account of 2017-18, and Sarah is going to be uh, presenting the report. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report sets out the results of KPMG Board of Mercy Travel's account for 2017-18 in the ISA 26 report, and it presents the final state of account for consideration. The um, framework for production, um, publication and audit of the accounts is, is a statutory deadline and it is it's under the Accounts and Audit Regs 2015. This is the first year that they have brought forward those deadlines. So whereas previously we were required to complete the accounts and have them certified by the Chief Financial Officer by the 30th of June, this year we've been 
certified having published and certified by the first of May. The auditors then had to take place between June and July. Again, this is truncated the actual time of available fees that they need to be quoted to finally signed off by the 13th of September. KPMG have carried out their work during June and July and their report detached the ISA 260 um, set findings um, these accounts have been considered by Mercy Travel and they were approved on the 25th of July and duly they have been consolidated with the combined authority accounts which was presented to the combined authority on the 27th of July for approval. The, the same accounts from the audit ISA 260 report were appended to this new information and I'm happy to take any questions they all may have. Thanks, sir. Any questions or comments? Part of the information is it comes from a wider body of the work, but that's the case 
probably come on because not only she got down here, she's walking away from the bus stop. <laughs> the bus is coming along the road, so we want to make sure that she's there to get her <laughs> child on. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? No? Okay. If I could uh, move the recommend recommendation in paragraph two of the report. No. Um, I to know this public question time. We've had a couple of questions from Mr. Brace. So, John, do you want to ask your first question? Yes, my first question is to you. Uh, details of the agenda and reports for public meetings of the Transport Committee used to be published around a week in advance of the meeting on Mersey Travel's website at mod.gov.mersey.travel.uk.net. I realise that the complete agenda packs for upcoming public meetings of the Transport Committee are now published on the LCRCA website. Will the LCRCA be publishing agendas and reports for upcoming public meetings in the future using the more user-friendly modern.gov software that it previously did on Mersey Travel's website? And if so, when do you expect this to happen? <coughs> Thanks for that, John. Uh, very good question, and we are pulling together the official response we'll get to you in the next few days. And you've got a second question? Yes, my second question is to uh, Councillor Steve Falk, so I think it's the lead member, is it for finance? Yeah. Uh, on the last day of the public inspection period for the 2017-18 accounts, I emailed a request to inspect and receive copies of 141 invoices relating to either Mersey Travel or the LCRCA for the 17-18 financial year. Whereas I realised that copies of eight of the invoices were supplied in response to an earlier FI request that still leaves copies of 133 invoices that I have not received. I made a request for copies of a similar quantity of invoices for another public body this year and the information request was supplied within five calendar days of the request being made. Two weeks ago I received a reply from a Mersey Travel employee implying that he was awaiting legal advice but I have not heard anything since. I attached to this question a two-page letter from the Director of the National Audit Office to Lambeth Council, which states it may not be appropriate to take the limitations in <coughs> FOI legislation and apply them to public inspection the senior information manager. Management officer had previously stated his intention to treat the request as an FOI request. Will Mersey Travel and the LCRCA supply me with copies of the 133 invoices requested on or before the date of this meeting, which will be four weeks after the request was originally made? Well, clearly we haven't been able to comply with the last part because we have, I still assume you haven't received the, the invoices. Okay. So my, my um, is thank you, John, for your ongoing and due diligence and examination of our systems over a long period of time. And given a detailed question, I'm going to take uh, the in lead and make sure we get a full written response to you within the due time scale. Who do I get the microphone back to? Oh, I think the <laughs> going to take a couple of minutes. Okay, there's um, no uh, statements. <coughs> and we don't have any urgent uh, AOV, so I think we're going to close on this. 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 Close on this.